This is the Volvo XC90 T6 inscription. Well, I'm sure most people have no idea what that means. In short, it is the fully loaded XC90, our almost fully loaded version of it. And it is all about luxury, all about comfort and amenities and overall design. So let's take a look at this. For as long as I can remember, Volvo has always been about minimalistic design, design that is not in your face. And in the case of this XC90, it looks executive to me. And what does that mean? It looks very, very mature and sophisticated without just throwing a bunch of gimmicks in your face. Now I'm not gonna get into all the marketing lingo about the XC90. The front end just looks straight up sophisticated. It doesn't look like they're trying to copy everybody else here. They have their own grill design, their own LED headlamp design. It looks more car-like than SUV and truck. And that's a big pro for somebody that's looking at this. It maintains smaller proportions on the front end. The back end of the XC90, the only way I can sum it up is it looks Volvo. It's very conservative, but one of the negative attributes of it is I was parked in a parking lot and I walked up to a CRV and I started to get in the CRV because I really thought that's what it was. And when you look at them side by side, I mean, even the light design is similar. But if you can get over that and realize, hey, you know, Volvo's true to themselves, they are just not trying to overdo it in the styling department, you're going to like this. It has an electronic lift gate and the manual operation is very slow because you know you're tied to the electric motors here but the back end is where this thing earns its money like most of these vehicles once the third row is folded down you have so much cargo capacity back here when you fold that second row down this turns into a cargo van i mean it is ridiculous how much stuff you can fit in here all the seats are manually controlled. There's no electronic adjustment to flip anything down, except for the second row headrest can be flipped down electronically through the uh, uh, infotainment. But everything else is manual, which is a really good thing. It's just kind of strange how they've done electronic, some things like the glove box and the headrest, but all the seats are still manual. It's kind of a disconnect there. But I prefer the manual uh, controls because you know it's not gonna break. That's one huge thing here. The carpeting, the pile of the carpeting is very, high quality this whole back section just feels well built even with this hatch up i can hear my voice getting muffled and deadened on the cabin of this interior it's not an echoey space now i'm not kidding you i could probably make this video over an hour because there is so much detail to cover in here but let's take it to turbowski and take a look at the underbody and some of the mechanicals before we move on So before we raised this up, we disabled the auto leveling feature of the air suspension, Scott, which is a good lead in to show this masterpiece under here. That's old news. It's all aluminum, all aluminum. And it looks like the dust shield is aluminum as well, which mm -hmm. say this is what you call double wishbone suspension. And you have forged lower control arms. Uh, this is what you typically see on luxury, modern luxury cars these days, or in the past as well, but it's starting to disappear more and more in favor of strut suspensions because they take up less room, they can weigh less. But you can tell Volvo optimized this for ride quality. The air dampers look tremendous in here. They look very large and in charge, and it's one of the primary reasons this thing rides like caviar. The brakes on here are pretty large as well, but you know, you're trying to bring down a massive, you know, a massive amount of weight and you're going to like the brake pedal feel in here. This is all you. It's one of those pedals that you have to almost push to the floor to get it to stop completely. So it's tuned for more casual driving. But I like the fact that there is a single exhaust spout here 
you don't have to break it off into two pieces. Yeah, except for when it goes bad, it's from there to there is all one piece. Well, it's easier. You just buy one part number. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to split it up. Uh, and then you your actuator for your flap, because that yeah. probably won't come out. Oh, yeah, true. It, I don't think I've ever changed exhaust on a Volvo. Well, it looks like it's pretty decent quality. It better be. Yeah, true. These control arms are straight out of a dump truck. They're huge. The airbags are off a dump truck trailer. Yeah. Or no, that would be stupid, a dump truck trailer. You a, a cement truck. A, a cement truck trailer <laughs> with the little mixing barrel. The airbags, <laughs> they're tremendous back here. They're huge. Yeah, but they're all that big in the back. I well, mean, they have to be. I mean, to be able to raise and lower, and this is where all the load bearing goes in for towing and all the bullshit if you're gonna use it for towing, so it's well, gotta be able to handle it. Too bad we just threw, throwed them in the garbage. We just we took out airbags from a GMC, GMC Envoy. Yeah. Because they failed. How did and it's they, cheaper to replace it with coil springs and different shocks than it is to replace the airbags. How big were the <clears> springs <throat> that you put in? The same as what oh, it was they're not. The, they're totally different than these. Oh, okay. Well, clearly here, the dampers are adjustable. <clears throat> the air suspension is adjustable and it has auto leveling features and it adjusts based on your driving condition. So if you go into off-road mode, it raises it up two inches. If you go into dynamic mode, it lowers the car about an inch and it's constantly variable depending on, you know, if you're on an unlevel surface. So that's one of the nice parts about it. But again, all you have to do is look at this for five minutes. And like you said, you know that down the road, if you're going to keep this this is an item that is going to be expensive to repair and replace. And it's about looking at the whole underbody of this car and cars of this type or SUVs of this type. That's the fine print of all this technology and all the fancy pants stuff. Well, I think the Audi, we had an Audi RS8. No, oh, what the hell? A8. A8. The front suspension was bad. It was like $2,400 just for both pieces without labor. Oh my God. For control arms or just no, the No, for the airbags. All the airbags. They're like the front. They don't have a separate shock. It's all in one. So this is where we're going to put this all into perspective, Scott. Volvo's main goal with their next generation of vehicles is to consolidate all their platforms and make them more scalable. So much like what Mazda is doing, because they could do it from scratch, is to take one architecture and be able to build up on it like they do with the 3, the CX-5, and the CX-9. Volvo is attempting to do the same thing here. And it makes it much cheaper to manufacture. It makes them able to develop new cars How faster. How much is this car? This car is about 75, close to 80. Oh, yeah, much cheaper. No, I mean to manufacture. Oh, yeah, it's a higher profit. Right. So they can get it in and out of the assembly line. They can design it and refresh it and get out new models much quicker. And the second thing they did here is they've dropped down their amount of available engines. They went from six engines down to two. They've gotten rid of everything but two four-cylinder motors. And the two four-cylinder motors they built, they designed them all around two things, weight reduction and size. And they knew that they were going to be doing forced induction and blowing them. How many cubic inches is this? I don't know the cubic inches, but I can tell you the displacement is two litres. Oh, man. You know how much horsepower this motor generates? 300. 316 horsepower and about 290 pounds of torque. And by the time it gets to the wheels, it's about 150. Yeah, with the all-wheel drive system, there's some loss there. Uh, and you know how they're able to get all this power generated off of a two liter? I'm not sure. You do know, forced induction. Tell me more about it. All right. It's covered by this black cover. So that you can't see it. requires anything. bolts. Well, they don't want you to see what's under here. It's hidden, all the horsepower is hidden under the cover. Kind of want to see. I do want to see too, I want to see the supercharger. This motor, this two liter has a supercharger and a turbocharger. And the concept is, you get naturally aspirated performance from the supercharger because it's making power at the low RPM. You don't have any turbo lag. So this turbocharger, I'm sorry, this supercharger, like you were talking about with some of the, the Mercedes that you're trying to repair, has a clutch that the ECU can activate and deactivate based on modes, based on throttle position. 
So it could turn off the supercharger essentially to take away parasitic loss from the motor. So that also allows for better fuel efficiency. It's not always just dragging down the motor. But when you get on it from the low RPM, flat out, it locks the clutch for the supercharger, gives you that initial boost, and then the turbocharger takes over at the higher RPM. So you're getting, the idea is to get linear power delivery from almost nothing to the high RPM. And that's one of the best and most interesting parts about this motor. The second part of it is the level of complication that it adds. Yes, they've reduced the size and the weight of this motor to make it more compact, more efficient. Uh, they've designed it for airflow. It's to get this level of horsepower out of a two liter and using this level of forced induction from top to bottom, they're trying to figure out how to get airflow in and out. They use ball bearing cam, cam seals or camshaft bearings. Uh, there's a whole bunch of weight reduction that they do on the inside to smooth airflow and get it in and out fast uh, with limited drag. And you know, we talk about this with a lot of cars, low fit friction piston rings, all the little tricks they do. How much horsepower did the Alpha 4C have? 240 something. Uh, how about that Focus? The RS was three something. And that doesn't need supercharger and turbocharger? No, it doesn't, but they're trying to eliminate turbo lag. That's what makes it the more, all f the fun of it. I was waiting for it to hit. It's like VTEC. Yeah, but you know. When's these, it going to hit? No, it's not going to hit anymore. All these cars are designed around, it's not around performance, it's I around know. efficiency. Yes. And that's the biggest negative part about this. If you're somebody that is coming from a car with higher horsepower, this is going to feel totally mundane. I mean, it's not that it's a bad experience. It's very quick, it's very smooth, it feels refined for a four cylinder, but it doesn't replace a V6 or a V8. So the last part of this, and if you are going to look at a vehicle of this level, clearly either one, you have the money to afford it, or two, you should, if you don't know, you should absolutely lease something like this. Uh, there is so much complexity here. There's so much cost from motor, drivetrain, sensors, cameras. It parks itself. And front to back, this thing is loaded with items that when, they, when it goes bad is going to bankrupt you. And that's the negative part about this car all the way around. The, the but kind it's of not this, this car. No, it's not. It's not about Volvo specifically. It's most all these higher end modern cars have just gotten so over the top with all of it. If you know that going in and everything's working, I think most people are gonna really like this car if they're looking for a luxury SUV. How many cogs does it have? Eight, and it's got a Japanese made transmission, ACOGS. Uh, everything else is pretty much Swedish. Is this paddle shifted? No, it's oh not. You can shift in the console, but Done. you can't pit We are off in the Volvo XC90. And I'm gonna say one thing about it. The one thing mostly that relates to this car in general or SUV this is all about the driving comfort rather than the driving experience because Volvo has designed this around amenities, around luxury, around being isolated from the outside and of course safety and technology. So if you're looking for a vehicle that is going to inspire some driving passion, this is not it. And that's totally okay because not every vehicle has to be about driver involvement. In fact, this is the next evolution of stripping all of that away. So if you get your mind wrapped around that, that you're not gonna be blown away with acceleration, braking, and overall handling, and you can appreciate some of the things about this vehicle that are amazing, uh, this might be the car for you. So we're going to go over a lot of that here going forward. Now this specific XC90 has the air suspension. So you have multiple drive modes. You have eco, comfort, off-road, and dynamic. And mostly, all, almost all the time, you're gonna ride in just comfort mode, the regular everyday setting. And this is one of the best, most isolated, uh, comfortable driving vehicles I've been in, I think since the Yukon XL, which also had air ride suspension. And it just, it soaks up every single bump and you just totally don't notice it. Uh, and that can be 
amazing if you're in an area with really shitty roads. Like the Midwest, we have winters, the roads are just always torn up. So here it's almost a complete non-issue. But the thing is, is what does it feel like when you decide you're gonna drive aggressively? So we're gonna switch this to dynamic mode. And once you're in dynamic mode, you can also go to your home screen here and then wait for the touch screen to respond. Come on, Jesus. Then you can turn ESC sport mode on and go into a manual mode and this is, has eight cogs, it's not a CVT. So you get to somewhat manually control your, your experience. So let's check this out. It auto upshifts, so you can forget about manually controlling your upshifts. Braking feels really kind of progressive. There's a lot of, you need to get, get a lot of pedal pressure going. It's not an on and off switch. That's oh, not gonna let me grab a lower gear. You know, the transmission's not all that responsive to doing any type of manual driving. So uh, you can scratch that off your list. This is not a sporty performing automatic transmission. It favors smoothness. It favor, favors all the, the comfort and luxury from the, the shifting behavior. Okay, well I just somehow shifted into neutral, but whatever, that's just kind of the point of this. There, it's almost silly to manually shift this car. You're gonna be driving in automatic mode almost all the time. Uh, and obviously I'm just gonna turn ESC Sport off here and drive it like a normal human being. I'm gonna put this back in comfort mode where the car raises itself up. Uh, and that's another thing that dynamic mode does is between these drive settings with air suspension, when you switch between modes, it will raise and lower the car based on what you're doing. Uh, it will also firm up in dynamic mode. It will adjust steering, and it also adjusts the throttle calibration, which in this car, uh, it totally screws up the linearity of the gas pedal. So what that means is, in dynamic mode, if you're pushing down the gas, even like 20%, it feels like you're going full throttle, and it makes the throttle response so much more sharp, but it just feels so synthetic that I, totally enjoy comfort mode over anything else in this. So we're gonna check out full throttle acceleration. We're gonna go into dynamic mode. I'm gonna leave it in automatic since, it, again, it means nothing. The car is now lowering itself. The suspension's changing, the steering, the throttle response, all of that is ready to go. And we're gonna turn ESC Sport on and just give it large here and see how it does. Acceleration, there's some type of faint fake engine noise, some digital engine noise being pumped into this cabin. It, it, it's very strange. And then you have the supercharger and the turbo in here, which makes it a very interesting sounding feeling acceleration. Uh, makes it very interesting sounding because it you can kind of hear the turbo and then you can kind of hear the supercharger at the same time. Man, this air suspension does such a nice job over every bump. I think overall, most people that are gonna drive this are really going to enjoy the, the horsepower, the steering, the comfort, and even on dynamic mode, it allows you to have a little bit of fun, and it blends all of those together perfectly for a vehicle that is super safe, family-oriented. Um, I haven't been in vehicles that do all this as well, and that's obviously why the XC90 has such high reviews pretty much by every single person that drives this. But, you know, Getting out of the Audi Q7, this is this is pretty impressive. Uh, I would say that it edges it out in a lot of ways, namely in the interior experience. You thought that vehicle was good overall dynamically. This 
this kind of takes it just slightly higher than that. And it's somewhat scary, and I think that, that's a negative part. I haven't been in a car or an SUV lately that is so refined, so comfortable, uh, with an element of luxury on the inside where I almost want to fall asleep driving it. Uh, it is, like I turn on the seat massagers, you have the heated steering wheel, you have all this stuff in here that makes it like, oh, I could just really chill out, where I almost want somebody driving me around in this. It, it just, it's almost too much for me. Um, and it's not in a bad way, it's just like, I would almost prefer a little bit of a noisier interior uh, more driving involvement so I can stay more focused on driving and this strips a lot of that away and that's one of the potential negatives of having something so overly refined from the inside out. The interior space of the XC90. This is 95% of why this vehicle is special and when I say that it's because I look at this interior and I, it feels like there was interior design done here. Like it wasn't slapped together. I'm not sure how much time they spent on it, but it seems so artisanal compared to almost every other car. You have real leather. You have real stitching that doesn't look like it was done in a child labor camp in China. You have real wood. You have real metals and alloys. Uh, the padding, the quality of the leather from the seats to the side bolsters, to the armrest areas, uh, even to the metal grill tops. All of this stuff is just quite, quite good. Now I have to give huge props to the team that was behind designing this interior space. And it's not just the look of it, it's not just the materials. It's the way that you interact with everything on the inside. From this suede or a la Cantera headliner that goes all the way to the back, to the leather coated surfaces, to the way that everything mechanically clicks and feels when you interact with it. All the mechanical controls in here are about as, as good as you can get. The next piece of this interior, and it's one of the most overlooked elements of interior design, is lighting. Volvo has decided to use LEDs front to back in here. And while that is not unusual in modern cars, the choice of color temperature is. They've chosen to run a 3500 to 4000 K bulb or LED array in here. And what that means is it's a warmer color temperature. You get in so many modern cars where I don't know if it's just a matter of cost, they use these bluish, very cold LED colors and it makes it feel very sterile, almost like a refrigerator lighting in most cars. You don't get this in here. It extends from the top to the dash to the ambient lighting to the door lighting all the way around. And they also give you the option of having these accent lights, which are you know strategically placed on the interior. You can kind of change the color of those from purple to yellow to orange to, to kind of, or just to match the other ambient lighting in the car. That's great. But one of the biggest negatives about it is, and I can't believe that they missed this, and this was found, of course, by a woman, is these makeup mirrors or uh, visor mirrors. It only has one LED light in here. And while the color temperature is really good for makeup and all that, there's only one and it's very, very dim. It's not enough light to do stuff at night with it. You have to supplement it with the other lights. That's a missed opportunity there. And it's just such a little detail, but it's something to note. Well, the hits keep coming here because the next biggest part are these seats or the seat design. And I, I can't, tell you how much I'm gonna miss riding on this interior when I get get rid of this car because the seating design in terms of bolster design the adjustability of it uh, the heating and the cooling works well well the cooling is a little loud when you have it on the higher setting but the whole, whole seat is completely adjustable I can't imagine too many people not fitting in here comfortably and just wanting to relax add that you have seat massagers and what it feels like is little Swedish meatballs pushing up and down your back. There's little air pockets that kind of go up and down from your middle of your shoulder area all the way down your lumbar area. And I, I almost always have it on when I'm driving. I really like that feature. And I think some people are gonna think it's not hard enough, but whatever, it's just the interior comfort in terms of seat design and all that is just top flight here. So now we're gonna hit the negative stuff. And there's a huge disconnect between the physical layer of this entire experience, lighting, textures, all the tactile areas that make it so good. The second part is technology. And this is where it's very forward 
and modern, but also a huge drag on the experience. Let's start with the infotainment. This is Volvo's newest iteration. Uh, it is, you know, they started with the Parrot Systems uh, base that was somewhat Android based. And what it looks like here to most untrained eyes is it looks like an iPad or a Samsung Galaxy tablet, just stuffed in the dash in portrait mode. And when you first look at it, you are wowed by the elegance of the interface, how simple it looks, the glossy textures around there, and the fact that it's not completely capacitive. You can use this with gloves on. Getting around it is extremely easy once everything's loaded up. You have three, three panes, three, three screens you can swipe, swipe left, uh, left and right. Uh, a center screen that kind of gives you your tiles of everything that's going on. Your left side is all your driver's aids and all the, all the buttons that would physically be here for like blind spot monitoring, traction control, they, sh they shove it on the screen. On the far right are all your other controls in terms of audio, all the apps and all of this. And I would say 90% of it is available while you're driving. The only thing that I've really found that it wouldn't let you do was text somebody a physical response with the keyboard, but yet I can search on Yelp while I'm on here, which is just, you know, continuity. Uh, when you're using it, when you get used to it, when you are parked, this is one of the best infotainment systems out there because you operate it like you would a tablet. But when you're driving, I can tell you right now, this is one of the worst examples of how to de design an interface for somebody that should be driving and paying attention to the road. Because this screen is down here and it is so cluttered with so many options and so many things available to you while you're driving. I, there's so many times where I've almost gone off the road trying to toggle something or get into Pandora and all of that. It's, this is the reason why technology is hampering cars. They're gonna blame people, but when you put this in here, it, it almost forces you to be distracted driving. I don't care what studies you do, people are gonna tinker around with this and it gives them an excuse not to pay attention. But it also gives uh, manufacturers an excuse to say, hey, look, we can save you from all the trappings that we've already given you to hang yourself. So th that's a diatribe. Whether you, whether you agree with me or not, the second part of this interface is when this car starts up, it is extremely laggy and slow to get around. Uh, the screen seems to freeze up a lot. You can't swipe left or right. It just takes forever to load this thing. I could be driving for about a minute and sometimes I still can't get certain things to load. And the worst part about it yet is they've removed the HVAC controls from the physical realm. There's no knobs or switches that you can just lightly tap down here like a normal car. It's all on the touch screen. And you can't get to this stuff when the car's loading up. Like I can't adjust the temperature. And even the temperature controls are just laggy as hell a lot of times. It freezes, it glitches, it delays. And I know why they did this. They wanted to get rid of all the physical controls because it looks better and cleaner. But what they've sacrificed is 50 plus years of human machine interface. Things that have worked in the past, they've gotten rid of for the sake of cleanliness, modernism and technology here. And it's one of the most broken parts of this whole user experience of the car. There's another thing that's a huge pro and a con for this vehicle is this center LCD screen or your gauge cluster in slash instrumentation. They've gotten rid of all the analog gauges. It's just a TFT screen. And this screen uh, is extremely well laid out. It's extremely clean and graphically it's crisp. Uh, I have almost no problems with reading the instrumentation. It's very simple. They stripped it down to the bare basics, which is very good. You can also add your mapping information on here and some of the other little details without totally confusing the user. Back to some of the, the best and brightest areas of this car is if you opt for the Bowers and Wilkins audio, rest assured this is one of the best audio systems of any vehicle I've been in, at least under $100,000. The level of clarity, the level of adjustment uh, is quite amazing and they truly give you a true equalizer in here that you can adjust. You have sound stage adjustment in terms of DSP effects. You have you can shut all that off. You can go to straight EQ and adjust all that out. It sounds bright and it sounds good even on compressed audio, on Bluetooth, on Sirius XM, and of course Pandora. But the best highlight is, you know, kind of uncompressed music or CDs in here, which the CDs on the armrest. That's where you can truly appreciate this cabin and how isolated and just insulated it is overall. It's really impressive. Much like the interior space in the front, the back is 
equally impressive. You have vents on the side, in the middle. It's all touch sensitive. It's so easy to use. You have seat heaters and the seat adjustability back here is excellent. I mean, if you're gonna use this as kind of like a regular vehicle for five people, there's no sacrifice on the second row. The third row is not that bad, and they say that it's okay for seven passengers, but I mean, it's still difficult. Like any three row crossover, you still kind of have to fidget with this and kind of crawl in here like a chimp to get in the back seats. I mean, it's not unwieldy, but it's certainly not minivan. Like if you're looking for something with that type of accessibility, this still isn't it. But I would say if you're gonna do you know, small kids in the back, this is gonna be an amazing, uh, definitely amazing alternative to a van. Uh, putting child seats in here, you can see all the configurations online. It's so simple, it's so easy. I mean, this car is all about the safety aspect too. I mean, you have that going for it. You know, this interior segment can probably go on a half hour. There is so much here. And that's a huge pro of this whole vehicle because to talk about an interior in this much detail means they've totally done something right. It's totally different. And I appreciate 95% of what they did here. But the biggest disconnect for me overall with this cabin space is the technology. It totally is a distraction. It's a takeaway from all the good elements here, like the electronic glove box release. Why? It's just something else to break. And there's so much of that on the inside of this car. It's just something to note. If you're gonna keep this long-term, if you're gonna buy this outright, you're gonna know there's all these little things in here that could potentially go wrong. There's so many failure points in terms of technology. Now, if you're in an area like I am where the winter's starting to creep in or you're, you're constantly exposed to bad weather or elevation change, having an all-wheel drive vehicle can kind of save your ass in a lot of conditions. But if you're, even if you're somebody that's in a perfect climate on straight roads, that's uh, always sunny, the XC90 is gonna offer so many things to different people. And because one of the best elements is its overall refinement, interior design, comfort, and just drivability is at the top of its class all throughout. Add the fact that you have a very elegant, refined exterior. It makes it for a very compelling vehicle for a family that has the extra cash or the disposable income for some of the features that are on this car. I, it, it's going to be very hard for me to give this back and then to look at kind of the midsize and the lower priced SUVs on the market because of this. But there are some negatives. The technology uh, is starting to take over in a very negative, adver adverse way here. Uh, some of the technology that's in here is just there for the sake of it to pad the spec sheets, the marketing uh, mumbo jumbo. And I think it distracts from so many of the good things that Volvo is trying to do from a mechanical design. But if you're looking for a three row crossover, a luxury three row crossover, I would say this is one of your top choices to go look at immediately.